All right, hello friends, this is Mr. Koga again. I'm here with our Thursday video for our distance learning video series. And we're gonna go over a few things that we're gonna do today. We're gonna do four things. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna play a game called Which One Doesn't Belong? And this one is a very fun game because um, it's accessible to any age group, anyone can play, it's a good game to play with your family. And you can pretty much do it with any subject and you'll see what we're gonna do with that activity. Number two, uh, we're gonna have another little math lesson to teach you another strategy. So we've been learning the open number line addition, open number line subtraction, and today we're gonna learn about decomposing numbers. That's when you take numbers apart based on place value. For Hummingbird Watch 2020, we're gonna learn about some facts that my students found um, while researching about hummingbirds, which should be pretty interesting. And for our read aloud, we're gonna read a book called The Boo-Boos That Changed the World. And it's about an accidental invention that helped change the world forever. All right, so that's the four things we're gonna do today. I hope you guys enjoy this video. And um, next week and the week after that is spring break. So I'm not sure if I'm gonna be making videos for those next couple weeks, but we will return after spring break with some awesome content for you guys. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, so I've never made music before, but I figure let's try and make some music just using our voice and some video clips. All right, here we go. Which one doesn't belong? Which one? doesn't belong you have to look at the images and then decide which one doesn't belong which one doesn't belong which one doesn't belong you have to look at the images and then decide which one doesn't belong, doesn't belong. Welcome to Which One Doesn't Belong? I'm your game show host, Mr. Koga. Welcome to another edition of Which One Doesn't Belong? The game where there are no wrong answers and every answer can be justified. All right, so we're going to jump into it and we're going to look at some pictures and some numbers, some shapes, all kinds of things and decide which one doesn't belong. All right, here we go. Aw, so the first set of images that we're going to show here are baby animals. So what I'd like for you to do is pause the video and talk to someone, could be a sister, brother, mom, dad, auntie, uncle, grandma, grandpa, could be anyone. Talk to them about all the different ways that you could pick one image and tell why it doesn't belong. All right, so go ahead and pause the video and have a conversation about which one does not belong. All right, and we're back. So I hope you had some good conversations about which one doesn't belong. Personally, I saw the sea turtle here on the bottom and I thought, hmm, it's the only one that doesn't have fur, which means it's the only one that is a reptile or the only one that isn't a mammal. So this one I thought, doesn't really belong. All right, let's take a look at the next set of images. Ooh, so looks like we have a basketball, a brownie, a frosted cookie, and a birthday cake. So again, pause the video right now, have a conversation to think of as many ways as possible and decide why one of the pictures doesn't belong. Already just looking at this, I can tell a couple of different ways why some of them don't belong. All right, go ahead and pause the video. All right, our last set of images here, we're gonna look at numbers. So now decide which of these numbers doesn't belong. And again, there is there are no wrong answers, as long as you can make sense of it in some way. So take a look at these numbers and have a conversation about why one of these numbers does not belong. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us on another edition of Which One Does Belong. I'm your host, Mr. Koga. Have a great day. All right, friends. Uh, so today for ma our math lesson, Mr. Koga, uh, we're going to be looking at one of my class's favorite 
favorite um, strategies for solving um, addition or subtraction problems. Uh, this one is called decomposing numbers. All right, so we're gonna be looking at three different numbers as examples, and I'm gonna give you a few numbers to try, or a few problems to try it on your own. So the problems we're gonna do today, um, we're gonna basically try some with regrouping and some without regrouping. Regrouping is always pretty tough because you're gonna be taking um, like ones and turning them into tens or tens turning them into a hundreds. Um, so it's tricky if you don't know the algorithm, but again, these strategies are the best way because it shows it more visually, which is awesome for second grade students or even any age student. Okay, so let's just try and jump into it. So. I'm going to try one without regrouping. So the first one we're going to do, let's try 35 plus 52. All right. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to get my trusty colors out. We're going to label the place value because place value is everything with decomposing numbers. Because all you're doing basically is decomposing the numbers into their place value components. So we're gonna first work with the tens. Doesn't really matter which one you work with. I guess you could work with the ones first. Um, but let's try and break off the tens first. So with this one, I have three tens and five tens. That basically means 30 plus 50. Now that's a lot easier to do in my head because I know three plus five is eight and that's eight tens, which is 80. Then I'm going to get the ones. Then I have five ones plus two ones equals seven ones. Then to end it, I'm just gonna add these two numbers together. So 80 plus seven is 87. Perfect. All right, so that was a little simple one. Now let's try to get a little trickier. Now I'm gonna do double digit numbers with regrouping and I'm gonna show you why it's simpler to do it this way. You can even, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll write it out for you. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's try 48 plus 25. So again, we're gonna start by labeling the place value. Decomposing numbers is all about place value. All right, let's hit the tens first. Four tens plus two tens equals six tens. But then we have the ones, which is eight plus five. But count on eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. We get that. But here's what we can do even further. We can go with the tens and the ones again. So from here, I can turn into this. Six tens plus one ten equals 70. And then the ones place, wrong color, whoops. Zero plus three equals three. And then if we add that all together, we get 73. Pretty simple, huh? And that was awesome because look what happened. We just did this math problem by breaking the numbers apart and then putting them back together. So that was addition with regrouping. Kind of tricky stuff. All right, let's try to go a little bit bigger. So now let's try and bring in some hundreds and we're gonna do one without um, place value regrouping. So let's try 213 plus 500 62, holy moly. All right, but again, start by labeling those place values. Let's get the hundred labeled. Let's get the tens labeled. And of course, let's get the one labeled. All right, so we're gonna jump into this by working with the hundreds first. I have two hundreds plus five hundreds. That gives me 700s. Then I'm gonna jump with the tens. One ten plus six tens equals seven tens. And do you notice how I'm lining my numbers up? I'm doing this on purpose. You see how I'm lining them up like this? They're all lined up. That's 
it's very much on purpose. You can see at the end why. Okay, now let's get the ones. Three ones plus two ones equals five ones. So now all I have to do is add up these numbers. And it's almost like you're reading them. 775. Oh, so simple. All right. But these ones were a little simple because we didn't have to regroup again. No regrouping, regrouping, no regrouping. Now it's time to regroup. Okay, now let's get tricky with it. Let's try 378. I know those numbers you gotta regroup. Plus 457. Okay, those are not easy numbers in the slightest. Hundreds, label those place values. Tens, label those place values. Ones, and guess what? Label those place values. Okay, let's start with the hundreds first. I have three hundreds plus four hundreds. That gives me seven hundreds. Then the tens, uh-oh. I have seven tens plus five tens, which gives me 12 tens. You like how I switch that up a little bit? Then we have the ones, eight ones plus seven ones equals 15 ones. Okay, so now what we could do is we could break it down even further. Let's take the hundreds again. Seven hundreds plus one hundred equals eight hundred. Okay, so let me actually draw them. So that took care of that. Now let's go with the tens. And we have a zero so we can kind of ignore that. But we have two tens plus one ten. It's 30. Then let's go with the ones. And again, there's zero, so we can kind of just ignore those. Five equals five. So now we're gonna add them all together. And again, it's just like reading the numbers from the biggest to smallest, 835. Whew. All right. So as you can see, decomposing numbers, breaking them down into the place values, then putting them back together at the end, super viable strategy. My kids love this strategy the most. It involves some algorithm, but it's also it helps you understand place value. Second grade, that is crucial in math. Understand place value and you will have a good time in mathematics, okay? All right, so now I'm gonna put some problems on the board. Here's one, two, three, four. Actually, let's do six problems. You guys can handle it. All right. There's your six problems, okay? I'll leave it on the screen for a little bit longer. You guys can go for it. And don't forget, label those place values. All right. All right, well, my students have been working hard and researching about these amazing animals. And I just wanted to share a few facts that we found. Number one, hummingbirds lay two eggs at a time. Is that true of this nest? Sure is. Number two, males have brighter feathers and the females are larger. Same with most animal species in the wild that you see. Most times the males are having bright colors and they're trying to attract the females. While females, the colors of their feathers are a little more muted or a little more just not as bright or flashy. Okay. Number three, hummingbird nests are made of sticks, leaves, moss, and spider webs. We confirmed that when we saw this nest. It was very interesting. They can grow between three to four inches and live up to four years. Hummingbirds can fly up, down, side to side, and even backwards. Wow. And they get their name from the humming sound that their wings make. And their hearts, their little hummingbird hearts, can beat at over 1,260 beats per minute. Incredible. 
Crikey, mate, this is an amazing find. And hummingbird eggs hatch within about two weeks of them being born. So the time for them to hatch is coming up. And then there'll be a few weeks until they fly away from the nest. Incredible. All right. Well, that's Hummingbird Watch 2020. You guys stay safe. I'll see you on Thursday. Hey, what's going on? This is Mr. Koga, and I'm here for our reel out for today, which is this book called The Boo-Boos That Changed the World, a true story about an accidental invention. Really? All right, so let's take a look at this book. It's by Barry Wittenstein, illustrated by Chris Sue. Oh, well, there we go. Once upon a time, in 1917 actually, a cotton buyer named Earl Dickinson married his beloved Josephine and they lived happily ever after. The end. Psych. Actually, that was just the beginning. The newlyweds expected to live a quiet life in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Instead, Earl and Josephine ended up changing the world one boo-boo at a time. You see, Josephine was accident prone. She often bumped and bruised herself while working around the house, but that was nothing compared to how she often injured herself in the kitchen. So it seems like boo-boos re is referring to some sort of accident or some sort of injury. Ouch! When she sliced and diced an onion, sometimes she sliced her finger too. Boo-hoo! When she grated cheese, she sometimes grated her knuckle. Arg! When she lifted a hot pot off the stove, she sometimes burned her hand. After Josephine winced in pain, she quickly grabbed a rag to stop the bleeding. But with bulky towels between her fingers, it was even harder for Josephine to hold a knife. She became even more accident prone. Impossible, you say? It's true. Josephine's klutziness had, had become a bloody problem. Every night when Earl came home from work, he looked forward to talking with Josephine and eating the wonderful meal she had prepared. That was until he saw his beloved's hands. Yikes! Her cuts might get infected. He had to step, he had to help his new bride. Earl's father was a doctor, so Earl knew a little bit about boo-boos and bandages. And luckily, he worked for a company that manufactured hospital supplies. Well, that's pretty convenient. Earl knew there had to be a solution, but what was it? Earl thought while he shaved in the morning, maybe if I, hmm. Earl thought while he bought cotton in the afternoon, then I could, hmm. And Earl thought some more while he lay in bed at night. And that would solve, hmm. Finally, a light bulb went off over his head. I got it! Earl yelled with excitement, waking up Josephine. What have you got? She asked. The bloody solution, of course, Earl replied. The next morning, Earl tried out his idea. Step one, he took a long piece of adhesive tape and laid it on the kitchen table, sticky side up. Step two, Earl cut small squares, squares of sterile gauze and stuck them on the tape every few inches. Step three, he placed a material called crinoline on top of the adhesive tape to keep the whole strip sterile. It's perfect, Earl said profoundly. Now all Josephine had to do was cut off a piece of the longer strip and put it on. She didn't need anybody's help. She needed only one hand. It worked. At last, they lived happily ever after. The end. But wait! Here comes the part about how Earl and Josephine changed the whole world. Earl guessed there was probably hundreds, possibly even thousands of people who could benefit from his invention. Earl and Josephine thought about making the bandages themselves, but they soon realized it was a too big a job. Earl told one of his coworkers about it, and the coworker encouraged Earl to meet with the company's president. At Earl's first, at first, Earl's boss, James Johnson, wasn't quite sure Earl's idea was good enough. Earl demonstrated how easy it was to put the bandages on. Then, Mr. Johnson saw his own light bulb. The company agreed to produce and sell the product. They combined the words bandage and first aid to create the clever name Band-Aid. Now Earl and Josephine would surely live happily ever after because Band-Aids were guaranteed to be an instant success. And with that, we have come to the end. Thank you and good night. Oops. 
not yet. Sorry. The first year, band-aids were made in a factory. It was a slower than slow process, and only had a small no- and only a small number could be manufactured by hand. They came rolled up and were eight and were eighteen ridiculous inches long and three ridiculous inches wide. That's huge, and they still had to be cut into pieces. Earl, Josephine, and Mr. Johnson had high expectations, but the band-aid boxes collected dust, ignored, and unwanted. A few years later, the company invented a machine that could mass-produce thousands of bandages. Instead of the user having to cut them up, each one was ready to go. Band-aids were now about three inches long and an inch wide. And they were cute, too. Each one had a little red string to pull in order to open up the paper wrapper. Yeah, I remember those. Uh, my grandma used to have those. Um, and they, they were good years and years later. Like, um, as you see, this lady has a little string. Instead of the little pull apart like a Ziploc, you had to pull a string that would rip across the whole bandage. Success! Band-Aids flew off the shelves. The end. Hmm. Not really. Unfortunately, even with the cute red string and the convenient size, the public wasn't sold on the idea. Mr. Johnson knew there had to be a solution. Um, Mr. Johnson does not give up. Neither does Earl. What happened next was truly a stroke of genius. The company decided to give the band-aids away. Mr. Johnson wondered who needed self-adhesive band-aids the most. And then a light bulb went off again. The Boy Scouts, of course! All those fall down, climb up, scratched elbows, scraped knees, boys got plenty of cuts. It didn't take long before the mothers of those rough and tumble boys saw how handy these little bandages were. So the they're doing things like woodworking, angling, which is fishing, bugling, pioneering, archery, ornithology, yeah, shout out Miss Townsley, that's studying birds, masonry, geology. That did it. Earl and Josephine's invention was a smash. During World War II, the company sent millions of free band-aids to the brave soldiers fighting overseas. In the years that followed, band-aids were made in different sizes, colors, and designs. Eh, you've probably seen them. Some even had pictures of cartoon characters on them. And that continues to this day, all over the world. From boisterous hot dog vendors in Brooklyn, fancy winemakers, fancy French winemakers, tired taxi drivers in Denmark, and English bobbies on bicycles to daredevil skateboarders in Saskatchewan, king crab fishermen in Alaska, sweaty Ugandan soccer players, and applauding audiences at at Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. The sounds of ahya, wah, ouch, echo still, but not for long. Because soon those snivels and sobs of pain are silenced by Earl and Josephine's accidental boo-boo invention. And that is the happiest ending of all. The end. Really. Let's see. No, it is the end. And um, this book's on Epic, so go ahead and check it out if you want to read the rest of this. Um, I'm not going to bore you by reading this entire page, but there are some cool facts back there. All right, you can learn more about Band-Aids by visiting these links here. All right, well, uh, that was The Boo-Boos That Changed the World, a true story about an accidental invention, really. And we finished this book, so good job, guys. All right. Um, If you're from California, sad news, and I'm really heartbroken about this, but we're going to be closing our schools for the rest of the school year. So we're not going to see each other until next school year. Um, It's kind of crazy to think about, but just stay strong, stay safe. We're going to get through this, and I'm going to be here for you guys, making videos and hanging out. So uh, one way or another, we'll see our way through this, all right? All right, have a great day, and stay safe out there.